What is land surveying? The best way that I can describe this is by putting it into three different categories. Science and technology, legal aspects, and art. That's right, the art of surveying. And we'll get into that later on in the video. Let's start with science and technology because that's probably the easiest one to comprehend. Surveying is probably one of the oldest professions known to mankind. Separating land, figuring out where it's located, and finding new ways and methods to measure this land. In the earliest days of surveying, we utilized the sun for direction and pacing to measure out our distances. Landmarks were used as monuments so people knew we were referencing certain areas and could begin our measurements from the same spot. As science and technology began to advance, opportunities for more advanced methods of measurements began to arise. Surveyors began utilizing Earth's magnetic field to find direction rather than using the sun. This gave birth to the compass. Surveyors would use a compass to determine where north was and then could figure out what direction they were moving in. Also, a standardized chain known as the Gunther chain was being introduced in the United States. This would help standardize distances as pacing varied from individual to individual. In today's units, the Gunther chain was 66 feet long, containing 100 links. Each link was 0.66 feet. Surveyor began using this equipment to establish patents in the newly founded United States. And many of the surveys in the early US colonial times used the compass and chain to establish sections within their states. As the technology began to evolve with the use of theatolites, surveyors were able to take more accurate angle measurements and using a steel tape using the imperial system, which includes feet, yards, and miles, units were now standardized rather than using links, chains, and rods. The innovation of the theatolite led to the creation of the total station, which allowed surveyors to do both angles and distances all in one shot. Throughout this time, surveyors would record all of this data in their field notes. The field notes would then be given to the office staff that would hand draft everything. However, as total stations became more mainstream and more advanced, and the use of the digital world began to evolve in the 1980s, total stations were given memory cards and they were able to store data digitally. Digital data meant that they were able to take that data into a computer and begin computer-aided drafting. Total stations became more and more user-friendly with the use of sensors and auto-lock prisms. And by the mid-2000s, we start to see the early generations of robotic total stations. Conventional total stations required three or four people in order to operate them, but with robotic total stations, the total station moves on its own and tracks the prism. So now you only needed one or two surveyors in order to complete the project. While total stations are still heavily used today, new technology allows us to integrate more effective data collections in certain applications. From the 1980s till about the early 2000s, satellite-based positioning was exclusively used by the US military and the government. However, by the late 2000s, the American Global Positioning System, or GPS, had gone mainstream for the consumer market, and surveyors were able to utilize these high-accuracy GPS receivers to achieve centimeter-level accuracy. This minimized the amount of equipment needed in order to capture data as this was a new method of collecting data. The solution that was given to them was through a satellite position rather than a localized coordinate system, which means these positions could also be put onto a global coordinate system that can be shared with anybody and anybody can work off of these points. Now satellite based positioning can generally speed up the surveying process, however it doesn't replace the survey total station because the total station provides a much higher relative accuracy. So when it comes to more critical projects, GPS or GNSS receives just weren't accurate enough and should only be used in certain applications. From 2012 to about 2016, drone surveying and aerial mapping technology began to be incorporated in surveying work. In 2016, the Federal Aviation Administration had standardized a process so that anyone could become a commercial drone pilot, including surveyors. This allowed people to use drones in a commercial setting under the FAA Part 107. Surveyors were able to utilize drones to capture data and process this data in the office to recreate a 3D reconstruction of their projects. While the accuracy may not be as good as a total station or a GPS satellite based position, it provided outputs that the other devices couldn't. Using a drone, you were able to create a point cloud which contained millions and millions of points and a visual reconstruction of your project. You can also output an ortho image, which is a high resolution image of your project, way higher than one that you would find on Google Earth. And truly, I think that the next big thing we're going to see in surveying is the use of cell phones. Currently, the camera sensors on these cell phones are extremely high megapixels and some of them, like the iPhone, have a LiDAR sensor, and utilizing third-party sensor integration, we're able to create higher accuracy maps using an iPhone. Now, while the science and technology of surveying is fascinating, it's important to understand that surveying is also heavily involved with government and in the law. The level of accuracy that a surveyor must achieve is legally defined in many states. Here in the state of Michigan, surveyors must adhere to an accuracy level of one part in 5,000, or an accuracy level that is 99.98% accurate. There's 
there's not a lot of room for error. So what does this mean for you as a homeowner? Let's say for instance, you and your neighbor are good friends. You know generally where your property is and you know where your neighbor's property is, but you never really had an issue that required you to find the exact location at which your boundary is located. Your neighbor decides to sell his house and he moves out and a new neighbor comes and moves in. One summer afternoon, you're cutting your grass and your neighbor comes out and says that you're cutting into his property. You tell them that you're not very sure where the exact property line is and he tells you that his real estate agent told him that it's up until the tree. Side note, if you're a real estate agent, please stop telling your clients where their property is located. You are not a surveyor and you don't know where a property starts and ends. You are creating a lot of extra work and headache for surveyors to deal with. So please, stop it. Stop it! So out of frustration, you decide you're gonna call a surveyor and have them survey your property. The most important thing to look out for is that you're hiring a surveyor that is licensed by the state as a professional surveyor. Now to become a professional surveyor, one must have a four year bachelor's degree in surveying and have four years of industry experience. Now some states, the education and the experience vary a little bit, but in most states, it's a bachelor's degree and then four years of experience. In addition to education and experience, surveyors must pass three exams, the Fundamentals of Surveying Exams, the National Principles and Practices of Surveying Exam, and the State Specific Surveying Exam. Okay, so back to the story. So you decide to call a surveyor. By law, the client is required to supply the surveyor with a legal description. This is usually found in your warranty deed uh, within your closing papers. The legal description provides a proper description of the land, and it is the roadmap for surveyors to define your property. An address just isn't enough information to know the legal bounds of your property, which is why surveyors will refuse to even give you a price without looking at the legal description. Now, there are several types of legal descriptions. If you live in a subdivision, you probably have a lot in a subdivision. If you live on a main road, but you're still in an urban area, you probably have a meets and bounds description, which is generally just a bunch of distances and angles. And the last type, if you live out in the country or in a very rural area with lots and lots of land, you probably have something known as aliquot parts. This is typically known as the description that says, as the part of a part of a part of a section. Now, depending on the type of description that you have, how accurate it is, how detailed it is, will tell you how affordable your survey will be. Generally, if the legal description is detailed and accurate, you're gonna get a much better price than a vague and inaccurate description. That's just because the surveyor is gonna have to do more work and their time isn't free. Once the survey is completed, they will monument the property by putting iron rods in the ground and this will define the boundary lines of your property. If your neighbor disagrees with your survey, they're welcome to hire their own surveyor. Although from my experience, most surveyors will agree with each other. They can't hire the same surveyor you did, so they'll have to hire somebody else. And if that surveyor does the same procedure as the first surveyor, they should come out with the same result. However, there are situations where one surveyor makes a mistake and now you have two different opinions on a boundary survey. In this case, you may find yourself in court and in front of a judge who will deem which survey is properly used. Surveyors can attend this session as an expert witness and they usually charge hundreds of dollars an hour so be prepared to pay them quite a bit of money i would also recommend bringing a lawyer on board and uh yeah honestly i just hope you never end up in that situation i would hope that you and your neighbor can be civil figure it out and save yourselves lots and lots of money now while serving is heavily influenced by science and technology and the legal system i believe the art of serving is truly one of the most fascinating professions in the entire world now i really believe that surveying is an art it's a representation of a creator's perspective while they visualize the world now when you think of an artist like Picasso, right? They're drawing up a beautiful painting. The painting has meaning, it has details, it has attributes, it has things that you find fascinating and enlighten you. Well, the characteristics that we find in this painting can also be found in a survey drawing when a surveyor is performing a topographic survey. A surveyor's job in a topographic survey is to accurately represent the real world in a drawing. You're basically drawing the world using high accuracy equipment. You're required to show existing features and the locations and elevations of these features and how they are in relation to each other in the job site. The surveyor needs to think about who's going to be looking at this drawing and making sure that they can visualize and conceptualize everything that is happening on the job site in a drawing. Another way of doing this is utilizing drones and capturing a perspective of the project in an area that they wouldn't have otherwise seen on the ground. Annotating and detailing what is important in the drawing can help anyone that's looking at the drawing visualize and understand the current conditions of the project. 3D reconstruction software allows us to create a virtual world of the project that we just surveyed. That way we're able to revisit 
visit the site without physically going there. That's art. You're creating a 3D model. And it's amazing to see surveyors use their creative minds to accurately capture data and virtually represent the world that we live in.